Hi, this is uh, Andrea. I'm just, we're just setting up with um, Hereditary Chief Namox on the phone. Uh, Namox, if you're on the phone, um, are you able to count to five so that we can know that you're connected? Yes, I am here. Okay, great. That's good. You don't have to do <laughs> Okay, thank you very much everyone for coming. We'll start the press conference now. Uh, my name is Andrea and I'll be just moderating the press conference. Um, we're here today, uh, of course, on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and we are, as always, extremely honored to be able to carry out our business on their very beautiful territories. Um, Today we are going to be having with the Indian Hereditary Leadership, the BC Civil Liberties Association, Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and uh, Legal Counsel discuss a recently filed complaint about the RCMP checkpoint and exclusion zone. Um, so we're going to begin this morning by going to the phones to hear from Hereditary Chief Namox of the Wet'suwet'en. Uh, we'll then go to the other speakers, and after we go to the speakers, we'll hear some questions from the floor in the room, and then we'll go to the phone lines in case there's questions on the phone lines. Um, so the first speaker is going to be uh, Hereditary Chief Namox, and that's capital N-A-apostrophe-M-O-K-S um, from the Wet'suwet'en. So I'll turn it over to you, Namox, to provide your opening comments. Thank you. Let me say to you, the fact that I think you sign me, as you mentioned, I am the chief of the office, and you at the highest ranking chief of the five, one of the five clans of the Wisconsin Nation. They are the only ones who are the of unceded, non treaty, undefeated land on behalf of our, my fellow chief, our nation, and the people that saw you on the union of BC and the union of BC. Indian chiefs who stand with us in this. Quite often when we speak, people turn a deaf ear to us, but when we stand together, that's what all the people listen to. So it's very important that the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs, our people and our nation, stand together with everyone. The complaint is against the RCMP, but it must involve everybody because it is not only a Wet'suwet'en issue, it is not a personal issue, it is not an just an indigenous issue. This is a human rights issue as well, so it involves everybody. This will affect everybody in Canada who is under the jurisdiction of the Crown itself. The RCMP are currently restricting our people's access to the territory. Since last year, January 7th, since the invasion on our territory, I have now restricted our access on health and food, our well-being, our freedom, and we do to all for listening to us. Because your voice, along with ours, will make a difference, not only in British Columbia, but in Canada itself. In the way not only indigenous people are treated, but all humans are treated. We are supposed to be a democratic country. We have to remind them, in democracy there is freedom. And in indigenous law, our law, another good thing, which translates to our law, our way. We always look after each other, our land, and our freedom. Being restricted by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police is unheard of. Myself, as Chief Namak, being the son of a Second World War veteran, my father went overseas to fight for freedom, and yet within this country, our freedom is restricted. That is unlawful, it is uncalled for, and we cannot be criminalized for using our law to access our land, our food, our medicine, our way of life, our very sacred ground that we stand on. This Complaint against the RCMP is well found, it's well documented, and we thank you all for this. Masak, Masak Chok. Thank you very much, uh, Nimax. And uh, I'll remind everyone on the phones to please mute your phone unless you're speaking. So sorry that we had a little feedback there for a bit. Um, the next speaker that we have is Parsha Walia, who is the executive director of the BC Civil Liberties Association. 
and um, her name is spelled H-A-R-S-H-A-W-A-L-I-A. -A -A. So we'll turn it over to Harsha. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you everyone for being here today. I want to start by acknowledging that we're on unceded Coast Salish territories, lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. I want to extend my greetings also to Chief Namaks, Hadi Chief, on the phone if you're still there. Um, I want to start by inviting everybody here in the media and anyone listening in to just imagine for a moment your neighborhood. And imagine here that the RCMP says that in your neighborhood there are fallen trees, hazardous materials, and weather conditions that will make it impossible for you to travel up the road and go to your home. The RCMP sets up a checkpoint that they control. They say that in the interests of public safety, they will decide who can pass through this checkpoint. They decide that only a handful of people can pass through the checkpoint and you are not one of them. Other neighbors who are stuck inside of their homes are told that if they leave and exit the checkpoint, they may not be able to come back. Family members of those who are behind the checkpoint attempt to cross the checkpoint in order to take emergency supplies and, supplies and food through for those who are behind the area. They are also not allowed through. Doctors and health practitioners are denied access to pass through and assess the health of people that are enrolled in a healing center that is behind the checkpoint. Doctors and health practitioners are told that they are required to provide private medical information about their patients. Lawyers, legal counsel, independent legal observers who are attempting to assist you during this difficult time are also allowed to come through sometimes, perhaps one day, but the next day they're told that the rules have changed and now they cannot come through. <coughs> Every day there's a caravan of people trying to get through. Everyone's identifications are checked and recorded and most of you actually can't get through despite providing your identification. One day you're told only teachers are let through, although most of the teachers are then denied access. The next day nurses are let through, though many of them are also denied. It is completely unclear and arbitrary how letting in certain classes or categories of people is somehow related to the goal of maintaining public safety. At no point are any efforts made to actually remove the trees that have fallen to the ground. One of the days you attempt to cross through, you notice that the roads are completely clear, plowed, and sanded. The RCMP tells you that you still cannot pass through and go to your home. Your neighborhood will feel like it is under siege. This gives you a small glimpse into what is happening in Wissowatan territories and has been happening for the past 17 days as a result of the RCMP checkpoint and exclusion zone set up at the 27 kilometer mark of Maurice West Forest Service Road, which has been up since January 13th. <laughs> The Wet'suwet'en understandably feel under siege. I emphasize here that neither the interlocutory injunction nor the enforcement order granted to CGL makes any mention of travel to or residence at the various sites or camps or residences on Wet'suwet'en territories. So to emphasize here, the RCMP checkpoint, which is on the 27 kilometer mark, lies completely outside the scope of the enforcement power granted to the RCMP by the injunction. So as a result of that, today the BCCLA, the Wet'suwet'en Hereditary Chiefs, and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs have filed a complaint to the chairperson of the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission for the RCMP. We are urging the chairperson to launch a chairperson-initiated complaint and public interest investigation regarding the improper and unlawful actions of the RCMP in implementing and enforcing a checkpoint and exclusion zone on Morris West Forest Serv Service Road in Wet'suwet'en Territory. This complaint and call for a public interest investigation is also supported by West Coast Environmental Law and Pivot Legal Society. The RCMP are broadly citing public safety to justify restricted access at the checkpoint. RCMP officers at the checkpoint have cited a range of inconsistent and shifting policies and procedures to those who are turned away, all of which are arbitrary, so policies such as only lawyers licensed to practice in BC or only pre-approved hereditary chiefs, and most of these do not in any way correlate to the stated goal of public safety. We have serious concerns about the overbroad scope as well as inconsistent, arbitrary, and discriminatory exercise of RCMP discretion in Wet'suwet'en territories. 
As part of the complaint, we are submitting eight first-hand accounts of people who have been denied access and turned away from the area. These first-hand accounts demonstrate a consistent, a consistent pattern of RCMP excluding people from the area, including the Soweton people, media, legal counsel, and those bringing food, medical, or emergency supplies, and demonstrates that the RCMP are exercising arbitrary and overbroad powers to check identification and deny people access. In effect, this does create an exclusion zone, and we stress that irrespective of name, and the RCMP claims that this is not an exclusion zone, this is actually an unnecessary exclusion zone that is outside the scope of RCMP discretionary power. Furthermore, there are no reasonable and probable grounds for the RCMP to randomly stop vehicles passing through and require identification of all drivers and passengers. RCMP interference in the daily lives of Wet'suwet'en people and their invited guests and with individual liberty is significant, arbitrary, and disproportionate to the stated goal of public safety. Furthermore, the RCMP checkpoint and exclusion zone is in clear violation of constitutionally recognized Wet'suwet'en law and jurisdiction, as well as the Constitution and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So specifically, we claim that uh, the RCMP exclusion zone is in violation of freedom of the press, section 2 of the Charter, section 2C of the Charter, freedom of peaceful assembly, section 2D, freedom of association, section 7, right to liberty and security of the person, section 9, the right to be free from arbitrary detention, as well as, of course, section 35 of the Constitution, which is Aboriginal rights and title. So, uh, in light of all the foregoing, the BCCLA, with Soweton Hereditary Chiefs, and the UBCIC call upon the Commission to treat our complaint as an official complaint and to launch a full investigation into the implementation of the RCMP Exclusion Zone and all RCMP members involved in its enforcement. We also emphasize here that the Exclusion Zone obstructs the lawful exercise of Wet'suwet'en jurisdiction and the ability of Wet'suwet'en people to live, govern, and access their lands as upheld by the Constitution and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We hope that the Commission will appreciate the urgency of this matter, and in the interim, we call on the RCMP to immediately dismantle the exclusion zone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harsha. Next, we're going to hear from Irina Sarek, who is a faculty member at the Guantlin Polytechnic University and a non-practicing lawyer who's been excluded from the RCMP exclusion zone, and her name is spelled I-R-I-N-A-C-E-R-I-C. -E thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Harsha, for, for, for setting up that so well, because I'm one of the people who was turned away. I was also let in. Um, but frankly, I still have no reason, I no, I still don't know why one day I couldn't go in, one day I did go in. I returned from the Wet'suwet'en territories on Sunday night, I had been invited up um, to help train legal observers, to do a little bit of legal observing, and to generally try and have a little bit of a legal eye on the ground to witness this exclusion zone. And I entirely agree that this is an exclusion zone, regardless of the names that the RCMP are trying to give to it, there's no doubt that that is the impact. Um, so I was actually turned away in the afternoon of Friday, January 24th. I was with another lawyer, Noah Ross, who is in fact counsel on the injunction case and has clients um, behind, behind that roadblock. Um, we were in a, a rental vehicle, a four by four pickup truck. Um, the, the weather was lovely and clear. It was actually, actually better than it had been in a number of days. Um, we were stopped at the checkpoint, of course. We provided our ID, we provided our law society identification. Uh, the person that we were traveling with, uh, one of the legal observers who we had in fact trained um, with the intent of, of monitoring police activity in the area. He was in the back seat of our truck. Uh, he also readily identified himself and then was told that despite being with counsel um, and accompanying us to assist us, that he could not enter. Um, we, were then, we were then told to, that we could drive him back, he could walk back, um, but that our ID would be recorded. And then suddenly, just a few moments later, the, the police officer returned and informed us that no, we were not being let in because we did not have a two-way radio or tire chains. Um, again, this, these were these are not this is not a road where this equipment is mandatory. It is not a radio-assisted road, and it is not a road where tire chains um, are ordinarily required. Uh, Mr. Ross had driven that same vehicle into 
into the territory past the checkpoint just two days before when the weathermen thought it would work. Um, so suddenly, suddenly we're turned away. We have meetings planned, we have a training plan beyond the checkpoint. We had plans, um, in fact, to, to hopefully remain until the next day and to have enough time to meet with everyone we want to meet with. So the impact of this was a denial of counsel, the right to counsel. Um, but you know, what could we do? We turned around. Uh, the next day, we came back. We had gone to some trouble to obtain a two-way radio um, to get tire chains. Uh, different officer on duty that day um, took our ID again, came back, did not ask about the chains, did not ask about the two-way radio, just said, go on in. Um, so there we were, a day late, um, with not much, not much time um, to do the work that we needed to do. Um, and just really sort of struck by how arbitrary this, this treatment had been. It really seems from, from my experience, from my conversations with others, that you're kind of at the, the mercy of the luck of the draw in terms of which police officer you get, which policies they decided they're going to enforce that day. Um, as, uh, as Harsha said, there's really sort of this um, ever-shifting um, set of circumstances that may or may not allow you in, none of which are supported by Canadian law, never mind with Suetun law. This has really been an expansion of RCMP authority without, without lawful grounds. Um, and for, for me and for others who have experienced this directly, it's really um, served to, to hamper our ability to move around in the territories, to do the jobs that we were up there to do, um, and for people who live there, of course, to simply live their lives without unnecessary state interference. Thank you. Um, our final speaker is Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, who is the president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and it is S T E W A R T P H I L L I P. Why Krishna Seal as Priest Asiut? I first want to um, acknowledge and and uh, send our greetings and. Uh, to Mayor <coughs> and the Wet'suwet'en people. And I want to thank our dear friends and allies for being here this morning uh, to draw public attention to a very serious, dangerous, and volatile um, uh, situation in Wet'suwet'en territory that continues to worsen as uh, we move forward. And uh, clearly, what has been described here is uh, completely unacceptable and a violation of the fundamental human rights of the Wet'suwet'en people. The last time I recall such measures being undertaken was during the opioid crisis. And it uh, doesn't bode well for the notions of reconciliation. Um, I would like to publicly call on uh, Premier John Horgan to get off his high colonial horse and, and honor the uh, Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs with, uh, uh, with his personal presence um, and, and go up to Wet'suwet'en territory and, and meet with hereditary chiefs. Uh, the hereditary chiefs have been asking for a face-to-face -face meeting with Premier Horgan, and um, you know he was—he has absolutely refused, and I believe that's uh, that's uh, highly irresponsible and an abrogation of his uh, leadership duties as the Premier of the Province of British Columbia, who has a responsibility to represent all peoples uh, within the Province of British Columbia. Uh, so, in order to de-escalate the situation with the time that we have available. Um, um, I think it's incumbent upon Premier Horgan to meet face to face with the hereditary chiefs to chart a path forward that will bring about a peaceful resolution of this very dangerous and volatile situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd also like to introduce Jessica Clogg from the West Coast Environmental Law, um, who has uh, endorsed the uh, complaint and is also available for questions. Um, so we'll go to questions now. We'll go to questions from the floor first, and then we will um, turn over to 
the phones in case anyone has questions. And I would like to ask everyone to still keep your phones on mute unless you are asking a question or um, answering a question in the case of uh, Neymar. So um, um, we'll turn it over to the reporters to see if there's any questions. to the CRCC, those were individual complaints by two individuals, uh, Delia Alexis Nickel and Cody Thomas Merriman. The complaint that we're filing today is a call for a policy complaint and a public interest investigation. So what we're arguing now is that this is a structural issue. What we'd argued before and assisted with was that there was a number of individuals who had made complaints. Um, and what we're suggesting now is that this is um, a very overbroad discretionary and punitive um, policy implemented by the RCMP. So this is now a policy complaint and a call for a public in interest investigation that goes beyond um, access being denied just to individuals. And are those two individuals also included in this? Yes, they are. Hi, um, I remember City News. Um, the question is for Hasha. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing you guys are going to the Mayor's Council today, and can you tell us what you guys will be discussing at the Mayor, Mayor's Council today? I'm not aware of going to the Mayor's Council. Okay. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer I want. Well, that's the, that's the answer you want? No, that's the answer they gave. They, they, they asked me to ask. So, you, you guys are not going to the Mayor's Council today? Do you know on what matter? I have no idea. Okay. Well, mm. perhaps if we can that's talk to you later. That's the question that I okay. from, from my desk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Hi, is it on BCIC News? And this is a question for Irina. You talked about the troubles going through and past the RCMP. Have you made contact with them since then to get a proper explanation or contact since then? And if they, if you have received contact or not, what's your feeling on it? Um, I have not directly made contact myself. Um, I did. I did speak with various officers throughout the time that I was on with Sioux territories. Um, and did have conversations, both sort of about my own situation, but also generally. Um, and it really, the answers that I got sort of fit in with this general tone of contradictory, shifting rationalizations um, that sometimes have to do with, uh, you know, with the injunction. That sometimes have to do with. Uh, road conditions that sometimes have to do with these trees that have now been on the ground for three weeks with no sign of being removed. 
Um, but, uh, but once I came back on Sunday night, I decided that what I really needed to do was be part of this complaint, was to try and have um, um, an investigation sooner rather than later, not have it you know, sit in the civilian review office for the, for the next six months. Because um, this, this is not about me. Um, this is about primarily, of course, the Mitsubishi people, but um, also all the, other, all the other people who are still experiencing the situation right now. Questions from the room? Okay, do we have any questions on the phone? Help from uh, the Indigenous Unit at CBC here in Vancouver. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, I'm wondering uh, from a like the CR from the CRCC, are they it's this um, request to them? Are they at this point the only body that has an ability to um, to look into how police are operating the checkpoint uh, on the ground? Or uh, you know, we keep hearing from politicians that it's the police are operating on their own and none their business. I'm just wondering, is the CRCC the only body that you can go to at this stage to ask for some type of intervention or investigation? Uh, yes, there's a, the avenues are certainly the CRCC in terms of official bodies. Of course, the RCMP commissioner themselves has the jurisdiction and the ability to decide on RCMP uh, policy and enforcement. Uh, I think in terms of politicians, as Grand Chief Stuart Phillips said, though they may not have direct intervention over RCMP policy, certainly the RCMP take direction from what's happening on the ground. And there is absolutely no reason for our politicians uh, at the provincial and federal level not to engage on a nation-to-nation -nation basis in order to ensure that there is a peaceful resolution of this matter and that with Soweton rights and title and jurisdiction is affirmed. Yeah, and just a quick follow-up question. Um, is there any precedent for the CRCC moving quickly in you know matters like such as this, given that you know this is a very active fluid situation on the Maurice Tomorrow Service Road? Uh, the RCMP commissioner has wide discretion, and also the chairperson of the CRCC has wide discretion on when they are going to initiate a, ch a chairperson initiated complaint, which is what we're asking for. So. Uh, which is why we, in addition to having filed and assisted with individual complaints to the CRCC, we're now directly asking the chairperson of the CRCC to immediately launch a chairperson-initiated complaint, which they can do at any time within their discretion. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions on the phone? Yeah, this is Lindsay Newman from the News, uh, from Vista Radio. Uh, so they recently, uh, Prima Gordon recently appointed Nathan Cullen as the liaison. Do you think this will help with this whole situation? What's your opinion on that? Chief Nanak, so you still are working? If I may, I'll respond to that. This is Chief Nanak. Go ahead. Please go ahead, Chief. We at the Grand Ferry Chiefs of the five plants, the 13 houses on the Aflaw Nation have agreed that uh, Nathan Cullen will be a liaison, but must be led with respect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, just one more. <clears throat> Hi, it's uh, Amy Smart again at the Canadian Press. Um, another question for you, Chief Namox. Um, a while back you said you were meeting with the Deputy Commissioner of the RCMP, and the RCMP had said there were several meetings scheduled. Um, I was just wondering if you are still meeting with her, or if those meetings have stalled. We are meeting with them. Also, we remind them that we are peaceful, and what they are doing is against not only the Canadian Charter of Rights, but also the Watsoka Law of Freedom and Access to our territory. And I will tell you directly what you said, that they are going to move in again. It is inevitable, is her words. But right now, we are on par. This is why we have been arrested, along with the province of the Columbia, 
that right now there is a seven day timeline. To tell you the truth, the timeline was up yesterday. So they have given us seven days and it is inevitable. And to me, it's illegal. We are not under martial law. Our people are not being hostage. That's all. Thank you. Okay, and if there's no more questions from the phone, then we will conclude the press conference. Thank you everyone for coming. And thank you, of course, to Neamans for joining us by phone from Wet'suwet'en Territory. Does anyone have any final remarks from the um, press? Or from Neamans? No? And your say seems silly? Hmm. Yeah, no, um, my computer is fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think we so it's an option. option. Maybe you forgot to go out okay, and okay. <laughs> We apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm just going to go back to Namox if you're still there. Sorry, you got cut off. Um, if, if you'd like, we'd love to hear some closing remarks from you. Okay, we might have lost Namax. Um, I'm just going to look to the front if anyone wants any closing remarks. Okay, I'll go to Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. I would just like to uh, respond to the uh, question about Nathan Cullen. I think it, it needs to be um, understood that the Wissota and Hereditary Chiefs asked um, in a very public way for a face-to-face -face meeting with Premier John Horgan, they did not ask for the appointment of Nathan Cullen. And again, I, I call out to Premier Horgan to get off his high horse and meet with hereditary chiefs in a genuine effort to de-escalate a very dangerous and volatile situation in what's all been turned toward. And with that, we will close. Thank you very much, Mr. Gunning.